Hello learners, welcome to NIO studio. Today we are going to take up topic nutrition and digestion part 2. In the previous chapter, we have studied what are the structures, organs and the glands involved in the digestive process. Now, this in this unit we will take up what is a digestive process. So basically we, we can uh, categorize the digestive process into the two types. Two first is the mechanical process and second is the chemical process. Mechanical process is cutting, grinding, swallowing and breaking food into small particles. Most of this work is carried out by the uh, teeth and the mouth. Then comes the chemical process. Chemical process is the enzymatic breakdown of complex food into simple absorbable forms and this chemical process starts with the salivary amylase in the mouth. Now let's talk of first the mechanical process, how lips they help, they hold the food in mouth, they help in sucking the liquids, then teeth, they cut, tear and grind the food, then comes the tongue, it mixes the food with saliva, turns it into a bolus and helps in the swallowing of food. Then esophagus moves the bolus to the stomach with the help of circular muscles in the alimentary canal. All the parts of the alimentary canal especially after esophagus are richly supplied with the circular muscles and in the esophagus stomach as well as the intestine the peristaltic movement due to the presence of this circular muscles in the walls of the these structures uh, they help in the mechanical digestion of food. So from esophagus helps in moving the bolus to the stomach with the help of these circular muscles in elementary canal which is known as the peristaltic movement. Now stomach mixes the food with the gastric juice and turns it into a chyme and pushes the chyme into the intestine. And intestine has we as now you know we have a small and a large intestine. In small intestine the maximum absorption of the nutrients takes place and in the large intestine basically the water is being absorbed. Here also due to the peristaltic movement the food moves on from small to the large and ultimately out of the body. The waste material is thrown out of the body. Now <coughs> the chemical digestion in mouth the raw or the uncooked starch with the help of enzyme amylase is converted into dextrins and the soluble partially hydrolyzed starch that is the cooked starch, cooked starch is partially hydrolyzed with the activity of en enzyme it is converted into a maltose which is again a disaccharide and I told you in the previous uh, session that this maltose, sucrose they are the disaccharides which are made up of two units of monosaccharides. In esophagus uh, the chemical digestion is being taken care by the salivary amylase which was produced in the mouth through the salivary glands and uh, in esophagus also the salivary uh, amylase keeps on working on the starches and uh, the food which becomes a bolus moves into the stomach by the peristalsis movement. Now this is a video clip to show how the peristaltic movement takes place in a uh, stomach and it will show the in internal side of the stomach lining and the spinches how the stomach opens and closes and helps in the movement of food. It is a small video clip and it will make the things very clear to you that how the peristaltic movement takes place in stomach, intestine and esophagus. It is the opening of the tube.
it's an actual endoscopic video which shows how the movement of muscles helps in opening and closing of the stomach walls and the movement of food now uh, in stomach uh, till esophagus the ph remains between 7 to 8 once the food moves into the stomach the stomach wall produces an hcl uh, this once the pro uh, hcl is produced in the stomach now the ph of the stomach is acidic and this HCl kills the bacteria, loosens the fibrous material in food so that the enzymes can act on it. It also curdles the milk so that it does not flow back. Once the milk gets curdled means the precipitate is being formed in the milk, it cannot flow back easily and, in, and it maintains the acidic pH. This acidic pH is required in stomach because the proteins are to be digested and the inactive pepsinogen pep, uh, that is an enzyme is converted into an active pepsin uh, due to the uh, acidic pH in the stomach. Now uh, I hope you know what pH is. pH is the hydrogen ion concentration and if the pH is less than 7 then it is acidic, 7 is the neutral and beyond 7 to 14 like from 8 and 14 it is the basic pH. So different enzymes they act at different pH because of their, their structure is such they cannot work if the uh, optimum pH that is required for their activity is not present at that place. And in the stomach the enzymes they act only once the pH is acidic. Then besides HCl and pepsinogen the another compound which is produced in the stomach is the mucin. mucin protects the gastrointestinal tract from the acid proteases, pathogenic microorganisms and mechanical trauma. Because the pH in stomach is very low, so it can affect the walls of the stomach and mucin is the compound which protects the walls, internal wall of the stomach. Now stomach wall secretes the gastric juices which is 98% water, 0.5% HCl, lubricant, mucin and enzyme pepsin in inactive form that is pepsinogen which by activity of the HCl changes to active pepsin which ultimately breaks down the proteins into smaller peptones. Now small intestine receives and produces first is the bile juice from liver it receives the bile juice from liver. Then it receives the pancreatic juice from pancreas and the intestinal juice from the special cells of the intestinal epithelium. That is we I told you there are uh, three glands which produces the juice and the uh, lining of stomach as well as the intestine which produce certain enzymes for the breakdown of food. What is the composition of the bile juice? The pH the, in the stomach the pH was acidic but again once the food the bolus moves from stomach in the form of a chyme to the intestine now for the activity of enzymes the pH that is required is around 8. So the bile juice it has sodium carbonate which neutralizes acid of the chyme and changes the pH of the chyme from acidic to the basic one. It also contains the bile salt which emulsify the fat that is it breaks big fat droplets to smaller ones to increase the surface area for the action of lipase. Then we have the pancreatic juice that is again secreted in the duodenum only. This pancreatic juice contains the amylase which converts starch to disaccharides. Then it has the lipase which breaks down fats to fatty acid and the glycerol. Then trypsinogen which is changed to active enzyme trypsin by the activity of enterokinase. Trypsin breaks the proteins. The further breaking down of protein takes place here in duodenum. Uh, part of the protein has already been broken down in the stomach. Then there is a chemotrypsin which changes milk protein casein to paracasein. 
Then intestinal juice contains the glycosidases which act on disaccharides maltose, sucrose and lactose. Uh, maltose is made up of two glucose molecules, sucrose is made up of glucose and fructose and the lactose is made up of glucose and galactose monosaccharides. Then it contains peptidases which act on peptides and converts them into the amino acids. Amino acids are the building block, block of proteins. Then lipases they bring complete breakdown of fats. Then the other as enzyme which, can, uh, which is present in the intestinal juices nucleases. These nucleases they break down the nucleus, nucleic acids into phosphate, sugar and the nitrogenous bases. This is a summary of the enzymes where they are produced, their site of release and the pH which is required for the activity of those enzymes which I have already discussed with you. Except for stomach at all other places you can see that the pH required for the activity of enzyme is all basic. Now we are through with the ingestion as well as the digestion now come now we will move on to the third step that is the absorption of nutrients. Now the nutrients that are absorbed in mouth are the water, water soluble vitamins, simple sugars like glucose. In stomach water is absorbed, glucose is absorbed, ethanol, some minerals, vitamins, some drugs are and the process of absorption is by osmosis that is from a region of high concentration to a lower concentration. Then in small intestine the maximum absorption takes place that is the reason that small intestine is a very long structure present in our body. The amino acids and monosaccharides are absorbed by a small finger like projections which are present on the wall of the intestine known as the villi. And from villi th these villi are richly supplied with very fine capillaries and they take the absorbed food to liver as well as to the different parts of the body or the different cells of the body. Then fatty acid and fatty acids and glycerol are absorbed by lacteals and they move these fatty acids and glycerols to the lymph vessels. Now this diagram shows the internal structure of the small intestine. You can see these uh, v-shaped movement it is a uh, these are the absorptive cells and the villi and on villi also the epithelium cells they also contain the microvilli. This villi and microvilli they increase the uh, surface area for the absorption of food and you, you can see in this diagram that uh, the villi are richly supplied with capillaries as well as the lacteals which ultimately move the absorbed food to various organs and cells of the body for their assimilation. Now the next is the assimilation. In assimilation the blood transport the absorbed food material to different body cells where food material becomes the integral component of the living protoplasm and are used for energy growth and repair. This is called the assimilation of food. The blood transport the absorbed food nutrients to different body cells where the food material becomes the integral part. Now, Fatty acid and glycerols are again converted into fats that may be used or stored in the adipose tissue. Adipose tissues is made up of the cells which store the fat. The simple sugars which are in excess are converted into complex polysaccharides like glycogen and is stored in the liver. These amino acids are utilized in the synthesis of proteins and the ones which are not used for building up of the body which are in excess are deaminated and removed from the body. So the three components of foods how they are digested and how they are stored 
we have discussed. Now, the last step of the digestion is the ejection. Ejection is the process of removal of undigested food through anus and it happens through a defecation reflex. It is a special reflex which results in emptying the rectum via anus by the relaxation of the spincher muscles present near the anal opening. Now, what are the hormones which controls the digestion? The various, these are the different hormones which are being produced by the duodenum, stomach or the gallbladder. Organs, we will say a mouth, the stimulus, what is the stimulus which results in the production of that enzyme or the hormone is the smell of food in mouth or the chewing that increases the salivation and the secretion of the thick saliva. In stomach, the presence of food and the mechanical stimulus results in the production of gastric juices from the stomach lining and the hormone gastrin which stimulates the production of gastric juices that is all done by the mechanical uh, stimulus which promotes the production of gastrin as well as the ultimately the gastric juices. In duodenum, the presence of food or the chyme increases the production of hormone secretin. It stimulates the production of pancreatic juice. Then cholecystokinin, it stimulates the production of bile, but enterogastrosterone stops the production of gastric juice in stomach once there is no food in stomach. So, there are some inhibitory that is the uh, enterogastrosterone, but rest of the hormones they have a stimul stimulatory effect on the production of juices, digestive juices. Now, liver is a very important organ or the gland present in the human body and it performs the various functions like it has a blood function, storage function and the metabolic function. The blood functions which are performed by the liver are the production of RBCs in an embryo only. Okay? After the embryo, the RBCs are produced in the bone marrow. Then prothrombin and thrombin which helps in the clotting of blood in adult are produced in the liver. It produces the heparin which prevents the clotting of blood. Okay? The, uh, the chemical substances which helps in clotting as well as which prevents the clotting are being secreted by the liver, produced in the liver and they destroy the worn out cells and removes worn out RBCs basically which sells the RBC cells and it removes the toxins from the blood. These are the blood functions of the uh, liver. Now, the storage function is it stores the iron and some metallic ions, also stores vitamin A, D and B12 and converts the extra blood glucose into glycogen and store it. The metabolic function is it, the regulation of blood sugar level, synthesis of fatty acid from carbohydrates which can be stored as fat, the excess of the carbohydrates, then breakdown of the excess amino acids and deamination and removal ultimately then. Now, we are through with the digestive process, but there are certain disorders which are there associated with our digestive system. Now, suppose if we take something which is not required, maybe at times we overeat or at times we do not find some smell very good or at times the infection in the body. So, any of these things can lead to the digestive disorders. The first digestive disorder we are going to study is the vomiting. Vomiting is a forcible voluntary or involuntary emptying of stomach contents through mouth. Now, what are the causes of vomiting? It can be a motion sickness like when we travel. Okay. When we are moving through those mountains, there is a lot of zigzag movement. So, that also results in the vomiting. Then there is an emotional stress, overeating, 
reaction to certain smells that happens in the case uh, of the pregnant women in the first trimester mostly, then food poisoning and also the infection. So, all these could be the reasons that the people uh, they have a feeling of vomiting. Now, what are the effects of this vomiting on the body? It may lead to dehydration. Repeated vomiting leads to injury of the esophageal inner lining and the remedy is an ORS or uh, ORS is a uh, oral rehydration salt uh, and it regulates the level of salts in the body because due to vomiting or uh, due to indigestion and if there is a loss of too much water then the person gets dehydrated and at times it can be fatal. So, ORS should be given at regular interval when the person gets a lot of uh, suffers from a vomiting. Then in diarrhea case also one has to give ORS only. What is diarrhea? Diarrhea is a when person passes the stool uh, 3 or more times in a day and the causative agent can be the infection, virus, protozoan, any of the organisms can be the infectious agent due to the rotavirus and the E. coli are the common causative agent and the symptoms are again the dehydro, uh, dehydration and the electrolyte imbalance. Now, the next disorder is the constipation. In constipation, the bowel movement becomes less frequent and difficult and it can be due to the lack of fiber in the diet or if we do not take adequate water or maybe due to the reaction of certain painkillers or the medicines or the stress or it could be due to the hypothyroidism. The cure is take lots of water and fiber in your diet. Another is the indigestion. It is also called the dyspepsia and it is a feeling of discomfort in the upper abdominal region. The causes is the overeating or the if we take a very fatty food. The symptom is the recurrent pain sensation in the upper abdomen and how we can prevent it is by not smoking or taking less caffeine or alcohol or taking a very light food. Now the last disorder is the jaundice. Jaundice in jaundice there is yellow, yellow discoloration of the skin and eyes due to high level of bilirubin in the blood. The causative agent is a virus which spreads through infected water and which leads to liver infection or blockage of the uh, bile duct and uh, impairs and ultimately as we have studied it impairs the uh, digestive process or the emulsification of fats or ultimately the digestion of the fats. Uh, the prevention can be we must adopt a very healthy lifestyle eat balanced diet and exercise regularly. So, with this uh, we are through with the topic nutrition and digestion and I hope in the light of the knowledge that we got through this chapter you will be able to understand the importance of healthy lifestyle and avoiding the junk food and how all these things they ultimately the food that we eat how it affects and impacts our body. Thank you.